another book launch, particularly special one. Um, our festival, the Goa Art Literary Festival, has kind of a family feel to it. Many people are here treated as family and come back again and again. In this instance, Mr. George Benezos, who's releasing the book, is actually family, and he's my uncle. Um, and he's also one of India's best known Indian humorists, a uh, very, very prominent journalist. I'll quickly read to you his bio on the back of his lovely book, which is available at the bookstore. It's called The, the Naked Liberal. Um, George was a liberal long before the word became fashionable and long after it fell into disrepute. In this anthology of his writings, he reflects on growing up as the eldest son of the eminent professor Armando Menezes, another of my uncles who's also in the house. A life spent between Goa and Bombay, his closest relationships, youthful experimentations with marijuana. Joining the BJP, he was an early member of the national board of the BJP, really, a friend of Vajpayee and being an outspoken lay conscience of the, of the Catholic Church. With exclusive access to photographs, private letters, and unpublished family memoirs, we, encourage, we, we encounter a family history of nationalism and activism in a writing career which spans over 60 years as a regular prominent columnist for the Times of India, Midday, Indian Express, Debonair, and Goa Today, and as a recipient of a Lifetime Award, Achievement Award for Journalism, George is a keen chronicler of our times, incisive and uncannily present. His writing will continue to speak to us intimately for a long time to come. And today I'm particularly pleased and honored that Eunice D'Souza will be releasing the book and is in conversation with him. Eunice has written a most marvelously, inci marvelously incisive and generous review of the book, um, which I hope she'll reprise a little bit for us. She's one of India's leading English language poets and will be reading on stage, performing outside this evening. I urge you to come for that night of absolutely beautiful poetry and sacred music. Um, her poems in collections such as Fix, Women in Dutch Painting, and Ways of Belonging, which is the theme of our festival, have been critically acclaimed and reflect a strong sense of individuality and feminism. Um, this book, which I highly urge you to get, is A Necklace of Skulls, contains all the verse Yulis Tsutsuva has published in her illustrious career, as also unpublished new and early poems. It is a profoundly intimate and intensely personal collection. At this point, I'd just like to remind you all that the bookstore outside has got a huge number of absolutely wonderful books. Um, two book award winners from last night will be speaking today, Jerry Pinto and Janice Pariak. They're just two members of an of outstanding lineup of, of writers. Um, the last panel was on translation. Um, our own Dumbledore Mauser's um, book called Tsunami Simon was released by Gulzar. It is also available in the bookstore. I urge you to please go and check it. Welcome. Eunice and George. Um, I'll maybe help the conversation a little bit here. Oh yes, it's fine. Um, Eunice, you you actually um, I read Uncle. If you don't mind, I'm going to call you Uncle George. Um, um, I read his book with with great excitement. I saw it in an early MS kind of. Uh, uh, form and it's a, it's quite unique. It's a book uh, written about him as well as uh, anthology of his writing. But I re saw the book when in your absolutely marvelous review in the Mumbai Mirror, where you identified actually what I think is possibly Uncle George's best piece of writing and a wonderful poem. Would you like to um, kind of describe what you thought of it, or shall we ask him to read the poem first? I'll read a poem uh, 
that some people might call erotic. The reason uh, the book is called the Naked Liberal is because for the first time in my life I let go. Uh, I expose myself to the cold in that sense and uh, published poems. The book contains poetry and dare not publish otherwise. It's a cowardly thing to do to publish them in the cover of a book instead of deciding them to the woman who might <coughs> So I'm going to read you a book uh, a poem. Of my Air Force days. Are allowed for searching me. <laughs> your file. Okay. It's called the pilot's love song. Does my voice come across to you? Yes. Yeah? Okay. Against the nose of your navel and the flat cockpit of your belly, your pelvic bones stick out like a joystick of a single seater I flew long years ago. Today once again I'm back on the runaway. My first ever solo flight. The palms wet, the fever trickling down my thighs prematurely. The engines throb like breasts touched by a gentle hand. I'm clear to take off. Have you ever been alone? Have you ever been alone? Held by the clouds, touching the face of God, with nothing between you but the instrument of your climbing? Let me take you there caressing the horsepower closer to the sun till the wings begin to melt upon us as did those of Vicarious. If I return to get my pilot's wings, our return must be a fusion. One cannot come without the other. Is it working? Yeah. I was looking through George's book, which I was going to write about, and I came across pieces, of course, that were familiar, and facts that were familiar. And I'll soon ask, for those who may not know him, uh, all the significant questions one is supposed to put to the person whose book one is launching. But I think one gets to know people better through their writing. And the poem which absolutely stunned me, I didn't even know he wrote poetry, is called Coral Tree in Gurai. Gurai Beach is a beach in Bombay where he and Tekla, his wife, had a home and they used to visit her sometimes. She was terminally ill. Now this is the poem I'm going to read. Coral Tree in Gurai. Each time I come to rest with you in this cottage on the beach, I see seasons in your face. Now you are a flame, coral rich with love, so intense, all manner of words, suck the sweetness 
in your breasts. Soon the seed will be scattered by careless winds, leafless and dry. Your arthritic limbs, a barren signal in the sky. And when the rains come, gently massaging a softness into your body's pain, I see you again. Green leaves covering your shyness with a freshly woven robe. You are my coral tree, love. And every day your changing moods, every year your changing body's seasons, envelop me with love, with callous pains, with youthful gentleness. Each strong and vibrant, I cannot tell the difference. I cannot tell if I love the giving or the taking away, the joyousness or the pain, the summer or the rain. Now to all sorts of prosaic questions. Um, the person who edited your book writes, George writes of a new Goa caught between modernity and its faded glory, waiting impatiently to rediscover itself amidst the pain of a stillborn freedom. If George's angst seems like elitist snobbery at times, he is redeemed by the fact that his anger and angst is shared by all Goans. Would you like to comment on that analysis, George? Let me see. My hearing is so bad. Yeah. 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 I could have said uh, that liberal as I am, today my views have changed. You know, Goa is something that you cannot fix into a moment of time. You write something about Goa and a few weeks later, the whole thing is irrelevant. But I would say that we are really, the whole thing about that I've written here is some, has been written so often about vote banks and so on and so forth, that um, the we are caught up, caught up from being, in being modern and coming home on a holiday and wanting, uh, discarding, as my brother who is here will tell you, discarding the fineries of modern uh, living and wanting the old Goa back, which is not happening. There are still people I've wrote, written about Goa, the wells, of, wells are full. And there are people, 
you say there is no fish but somebody in the village, the whole thing said, uh, who, who is the keeper of the manos, you know, says Bab, Korn Sankta Duga Nishte Meo Mamun. Hotel Wala Ne Nishte Sauleng Gatla. And he says, Tuka, Tu Mamso. Tu Mamso, go on and go on and go on. And Tuka, Nishte Sotans Meo Pele. So there is the. You know, all, all this, the transition between the lines you cannot be drawn. And there are the people that make the things different. You say somewhere in the book, and you said it just now as well, that you sometimes long for the old Goa. But the old Goa had all sorts of special features that we're not crazy about now. The elitism, and I don't mean one particular kind of elitism, the elitism of the Margava crowd, who looked down on the elitism of the Bardes crowd. According to that definition, all of us are elite, but George is more elite than I am, because I am from Valdez. Okay? So, all this about who spoke Portuguese, you know, and who came from which family, I think one of the things that would make me never want to live in Goa is this incessant family consciousness. Who's who, who's married to whom? I'm used to Bombay, where the judgments are much more professional. I live in a total dump, a flat in a boxy flat, which is due for redevelopment. I wish I could boast of one of these wonderful houses which are so dark and so endless that I'm not sure one would last there very long. So that for me is Goa, old Goa. I don't mean geographically, I mean mentally. You know, one thing that's very interesting about both of your views of Goa is they are extremely profoundly colored by your highly diasporic existence. Right? These are diaspora preoccupations, which don't actually, I mean, uh, for whatever it's worth, I'm a returnee uh, of sorts. And my eyes are uh, open to a completely different kind of world. These, I think things like nostalgia and distance, they also can confuse and addle and, and pervert. You know, I mean, I'm not saying that not everything that we're talking about here is true. I mean, uh, Jip wrote about it in Jaco uh, um, um absolutely black novel. I mean, uh, hundred years than a hundred years ago. But uh, in today's goal, new concerns and new challenges, new opportunities, this is a highly changed place. But not that I do not appreciate, I mean, your poems and his writing, but they are colored by our diasporic experience. You know, that's the memory and the associations with, which still exist, by the way. I mean, now, uh, I know I've written some poems. I hadn't thought of writing before that. But things had simmered, you know. The kind of assessments go on men made. When they viewed me, one considered me short but smart. Smart here meaning intelligent. Okay not smart to look at. And I know my, my cousins, one of them at least, the entire family went on the honeymoon with them. The entire family. And ever after that they all went together everywhere. I'd go crazy 
in such. Yeah? Fair enough. And of course, uh, a woman growing up at the time you did it with Goan's yeah. pictures is completely different from George who grew up as the oldest son of Armando Menezes in a, in a culture that you know, deeply respected that. I'd like to ask uh, George a question here, which is, you talked about some of the motivations that made you a writer. How did this happen for you, Uncle George? I mean, you obviously yeah. your father. How did it happen that you were motivated to write? Obviously, your father was a very well-known poet and, and poet and poet and translator, and uh, those are difficult shoes shoes to even try to fill. But you became a writer at an early age and continued to write for maybe 50 years or more than that. I, um, all my life I have been uh, plagued in a, in a beautiful way uh, that I am the son of Armando Menezes and that I should be doing naturally in, in those days uh, I was not sent for a DNA test uh, although I did a lot of wrong things in my life. But um, it is it is a family thing that trickles down into our system. My dad never asked me to write. It's very strange. The motivator for my writing was my mother. And for her good part of their marriage, she didn't even know English. But she would sit in front of me and make me practice for the elocution on, uh, on competitions. So there is something there that, that uh, we have owe a lot to um, but there can be also a re reverse Uh, osmosis. I'm sorry, we've been uh, running a little bit late, so we're almost at the end. I know the audience would uh, like to ask some questions. Any questions for George? <laughs> Armando Menezes' is a great grandson wants to ask him a question. Any other, any questions? I'm curious. Um, what is what is uh, how did the politics? You had a you have written with a po political agenda very often, a strong political agenda, partly liberal but also in a way conservative because you defended from the lay perspective you defended the Catholic Church. Would you like to talk just briefly about the political aspect of your writing? I, uh, I react very strongly, very strongly. I have a strong management core in my being. Uh, and uh, I've been in management for 25 years. And therefore, when there is a non-governance, where there is no existence of any law and order, and we have a, a Prime Minister who is famously known to nod his head and a woman who governs the country in the way she does to her children. I get angry. You know, I used to write humor and after a stage, people said to me, George, your humor seems to be forced. You're not writing, it doesn't flow as it used to before. And I said, I'm becoming more and more angry. And it's becoming very difficult. Therefore, I am, I could not watch the decadence that is taking place. And therefore, I moved into politics because uh, you can make a difference. It's difficult. 
there are people who still stand there amidst the chaos and the scams and the, and the thievery that's going on and still maintain their honor. And I can vouch for a number of people in the BJP. I spent, uh, I somehow do to do these things much against my will. I got uh, into the Air Force because I was in love with a girl in the, in the law college. And she wanted me to join the Air Force. And when I went for my training, she got married to a surgeon. <laughs> You know, my life is full of these kinds of things, of being pushed into things, pushed into things. And politics was one of these. I made some speeches in Bandha for Ram Jain Malani um, without knowing much about the BJP. And he got a whole lot of Catholic votes that turned the tide and he was elected MB. And then the next thing I knew was a meeting with Vajpai and Ram Jatmalaji said, we need a guy like this in our party. And moreover, I'm quite sure he winked at him and said, he's a Christian. <laughs> you know, uh, that adds to our motivation to get him into the party. So I spent three uh, two years with some moderates. There are still moderates that we tell you in the party. But it, it was a long struggle. And uh, I gave up. But I have been in active politics. We, we, I believe that we can change things. And it requires the citizens to work from door to door to get that kind of thing done. We elected a citizen. We elected a citizen candidate to the corporation, which was unheard of. So there is a desire for me. You know, we have changed the face of Andhra. Politics is this is the route by which we can make a difference. <coughs> Thank you very much. That actually a highly apt liberal message. Um, that's a belief in government in the political process. Um, please acquire books by Mr. Menezes. He'll be ready to sign them outside. He'll stay for a little bit, I hope. Um, thank you very much, Eunice, for that wonderful session.